Well, welcome tonight. It's Wednesday night. It's our midweek Bible study and prayer time at uh, Arbor Christian Fellowship, and I'm glad you've joined us and viewing with us tonight. I want to take a look at a psalm where we've been doing a sermon series on psalms, help and hope for us from the psalms. And yeah, we're living in a day and age, and if you watch the news, that we need help, and we especially need hope, and our hope is in Jesus Christ. Our hope is in God. And uh, so I want to take a look at a psalm, Psalm 139. It's a very familiar uh, psalm of creation. And I've titled this, A Psalm of Who God Is and A Psalm of Our Worth in Him. Uh, there's a lot about, you know, self-worth and uh, things like that. And, uh, but our worth comes in a couple areas. Number one, that we are created by God. He, he made us, and He made us unique. He loved us before we were uh, created. And this Psalm 139 captures a couple of things about our worth in Him. So let me begin. Uh, let me start off with a, a word of prayer. Father, we pray that you would open up our eyes and hearts to hear your word speak to us specifically. We thank you, God, for this psalm. For I pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So this is a psalm of David. He wrote a bunch of the psalms in his relationship uh, with God. David, king, is known as the sweet psalmist of Israel. A, a psalm is... is uh, means two things, either a prayer, but generally it means a song. In fact, the book of Psalms uh, in the Old Testament, uh, that was the hymn book of the Hebrew worship in the synagogue and in the temple. And as I've said for the last couple of Wednesday nights, the beauty of the book of Psalms and the Bible is if you have a complete Bible, Old and New Testament, if you open the Bible to the very center, you'll you'll hit the book of Psalms. Now, if you have a big concordance and a big index in the back of your Bible or a dictionary, Bible dictionary in the back of some have, uh, still Psalms is big enough that you may hit it. What I'm trying to get across is that it is the heart of the Scripture. How to be in right relationship with God is very central in the Bible. It is the dead center. So we want to take a look, and I'm just going to take some tidbits an application of truth that ought to lift our hearts and ought to reinforce for you and I, no matter what, our worth to God. Our, our, our worth to God. Psalm 139 begins with the words, O Lord. All right, so right from the get-go, David identifies who God is. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Uh, in other words, uh, there's no such thing as deism here. Uh, it's theism. And there's three isms, okay? There's atheism that says that there is no God, okay? Uh, Psalmist tells us uh, in Psalm 14.1 and Psalm 53.1 that the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. It's repeated twice. Psalm 14, 1. Psalm 53, 1. And when it says the fool has said in his heart there is no God, the word fool in the Hebrew doesn't have any relationship to stupid or dumb. Literally, the word fool is the word nabal, N-A-B-A-L in Hebrew. And it has nothing to do with IQ or knowledge. It doesn't mean stupidity. Literally, the word Nabal means empty. The empty person has said in their empty hearts, there is no God. And nothing can be more empty in the long run and in the eternal run than a life that's devoid of God. That's total, true emptiness. So it says here that uh, you scrutinize uh, everything about me. God knows us. You have... Verse 5, enclose me. Uh, you've laid your hand upon me. We're going to revisit that. You've laid your hand upon me. And, and then as far as escape from God, uh, verse 7, where can I go from your spirit? Wherever I go, you, you are there. You are there. Uh, verse 12 even says that if I try to escape into the darkness, 
Uh, even the darkness is not dark to you. Now think of this. Okay, now we have light and dark. We have the sunshine in the day and nighttime. Go into a room at night and there's no light. It's it's dark. But we we see in we see the things of dark. But think of this. For God, there is no darkness. He he sees through the darkness and he sees the uh, uh, the light. Uh, notice the end of verse 12. Darkness and light are alike to you. Darkness and light are alike to you. Verse 17 is a wonderful verse. How precious are your thoughts to me, O God. How vast is the, the sum of them. And then it ends the same way it talked about God knowing us, knowing our hearts, knowing the real you and I. See, every Sunday morning in church, we see one another and we be, tend to see the surface, the outer appearance. Now, some people we know a little better, might know a, a little closer, a little longer. And, you know, in some of our churches, people have known each other for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Or some of the pioneers that pioneered and started a church have been there the, the, the whole time. But God knows us even better than that. Notice the verses 23, 24 ending uh, this wonderful psalm. Search me, O God, and know my heart, and try and know my anxious thoughts, and see if there's any hurtful way in me, and lead me to the way that is everlasting. A couple of things that we can glom from this is, number one, that, that God knows us. He, he, he knows us. Perhaps we've said to somebody, but you don't really know me. You don't know me. You don't know my pain, my hurt, you don't know my needs, you don't, well, God knows us, verse 1, he searches us, and you have known me, and not only that, he knows and understands, look at verse 2, you know when I sit down and get up, you understand my thought from afar, God knows us not only on the surface and on the outside, God knows us inside, and he created us uh, that way, we're in God's special creation. Uh, I remember as a teenager, <laughs> I guess all teenagers, you know, nobody understands me. My parents don't understand me. Uh, but God understands us. Uh, God, God understands us. And we see this. You know when I sit down, not just the physical movement and action. God knows right now that here we are together at this table at Arbor Christian Fellowship. God knows where where we are, uh, where we sit down, but He understands what's inside, what's inside. One of the things that I learned as a coach of Little League, and I coached in San Jose, California, uh, at Morgan Hill uh, Little League for seven years, and this was when my son was going through Little League, and I got to be the head coach and manager. Of a, of a little league uh, team. And one of the things that I learned uh, is that when the guys would swing or hit or run, pitch and throw, uh, mainly swinging at, at, at the ball, you, you can, on the surface, judge some raw talent. But you can never judge what's in the heart of that little player. If he's got the heart and the fire and oftentimes I discovered the seven years I coached Little League, and perhaps some of you have discovered the same thing. If you ever coached the basketball team or, let's say, coached Pop Warner football or, or Little League, Colt League, Pony League, or, or something, that oftentimes it's not so much the physical talent of the player, but the heart, the, the, the heart, the, the desire, and and, and the fire, and the beautiful thing about God, and this is a lesson to me as a pastor, as I see people, and I, I'm not saying I judge people, but sometimes I might make a snap evaluation on a new member or a visitor or a situation, and you know what? I only see the surface, and I have very limited understanding, but you know what? Verse 2, God knows when I sit down and when I rise up, God understands my thoughts from afar, from eternity. God knows. God is, is there. God is there. He knows us. So we see that God knows and God understands us. 
as I said, this is a psalm of who God is and our worth, our worth uh, to him. Uh, verse 17, how precious are your thoughts to me, O God, how vast is the, is the sum of them. Verse 14, David writes, I will give thanks to you. And then here's the interesting thing. Uh, he says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am fearfully and, and, and wonderfully made. And uh, we see that as the creation of God, all the unique things about our, our physicalness and about our being and things, uh, I will give thanks to you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works and my soul knows it very well. Uh, it, it is just amazing the, the work that we are that God has made. We consist of about 60 trillion cells, 100,000 miles of nerve fiber. <laughs> Can you imagine that? 100,000 miles of nerve fiber. It's only 24,000 miles around the circumference of the globe, around uh, at, at uh, 100,000 miles of nerve fiber, uh, 60,000 miles of vessels, blood vessels. Uh, we are amazingly, fearfully, and wonderfully made. And this is a place where the Bible actually coincides uh, with uh, a science, uh, with, with some science. And as we truly look at the truth of the Bible and look at true science, there is no contradictory thing between true science and what God has revealed about creation that's in the Bible. We are created for a relationship with God. Notice back to verse 1, Lord, you have searched me and known me. Now, the term Lord, Adonai, talks about our relational aspect with God, Lord. The word God, or Theos, talks about God himself in his entity, but Lord always has a vertical relational aspect. He is not just God, but he is Lord. It's interesting, in Genesis, after the use of the word God in creation, when it talks about Adam and Eve being created, it is the term Lord God. Adonai Theos, the God of relationship. Not only is that Adonai, O Lord, as in verse 1. We've only looked at two words, the first two words of this great psalm, and we're, we're seeing some depth. O Lord is not only uh, the relational aspect but also the accountability, accountability. Uh, he is our maker, and we are accountable uh, to God. Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down, you understand my thought from afar. And by the way, if God takes into account when we sit down, and guess what? When you sat down in the chair, those of you here, uh, when you sat down in the chair, it was important to God. He took account of it. it. It mattered to God. So think about this. And this is the first heavy for tonight. Think about this. If God takes into account my sitting down on a chair, how much more do you think God takes into account our, our hurt, our brokenness, our pain, our disappointment? Maybe we were rejected in, in some situation by a worker, or a family member, or a manager, or something, and, and it hurts. God knows about it. God takes that into account. And notice in the end of verse 2, he understands. He understands. Now, now there's the two mistaken attitudes about God that's somewhat relevant in the world today, and maybe even increasing some momentum. The first one is atheism. Uh, a theism Theism means to believe in God, okay? A, before theism, atheism is known as an alpha primitive. In other words, it cancels and negates. A theist believes in God. An atheist does not believe in God. It's an alpha primitive. It, it cancels out. So atheism is a prevalent belief today 
under so-called modern science, but there is nothing that's been discovered that is scientific that refutes God. By the way, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But you know something? I've studied science. I was forced to take it at Fullerton Junior College, forced to take it at Cal Baptist College, and uh, uh, the thing about science, as true as science is relegated to be, are you aware that science changes? Science changes with more and more discoveries, uh, more and more. Uh, it was believed uh, back years and years and years and years ago that if uh, man ever traveled at the speed of sound, that at the moment they hit what they call Mach 1, uh, the, the speed of, of sound, uh, that they would disintegrate. All right, now all of us at one time or another, if we've ever ridden in a jet airplane, a big jetliner have traveled faster than the speed of light. Now the speed, I mean the speed of sound, speed of light, that's a complete different story. But at one time science said if any, of course that was back in the horse and buggy days, and that was like when the cars were first started, and they didn't go as fast as some of those that, that go today. But if you ever went a certain amount of mileage, you, you would totally disintegrate. But science keeps changing. The truth of God's word and God's scripture is permanent. It, it remains the same. So we have a God who knows and a God who understands, a God who changes not. And we need that stability and we need that ability with all the shifting sands of this world and this life today. I mean, have you watched the news recently? I mean, it's getting crazier and, and crazier and crazier. Our one solid hope is Jesus Christ. Uh, it, it goes on that there's no escape from God. Look at verse 7. Where can I go from your spirit? If I ascend to the heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, which is a technical term uh, for the deepest abode, oftentimes it's translated into English uh, as, as hell, or a place of departure, you are there. Uh, we cannot escape from God. He is everywhere. And uh, he talks about the, he, God's right hand laying a hold of us and, and, and leading us. And as I alluded earlier, here's something fascinating. Even the darkness to God is not darkness. So we shut off all the lights tonight in this building, we would be in darkness. But guess what? God still sees. He is not in darkness. And all this is, is very relational. Look at the end of verse 12. Darkness and light are alike to you. Darkness and light are alike to you. So focusing on verse 14 before I give us some applications and uh, a few takeaways. David writes, I will give thanks to you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you uh, when I was made in secret. Here's one of the reasons why abortion is wrong. That even, even in the womb, God knows, God takes into a, account. And that uh, verse 15, my frame was not hidden from you, though it was hidden until the date of birth, uh, so to speak. Uh, verse 17, how precious are your thoughts to me, O oh God? How vast is the sum of them? We are precious to God. We matter to God. But David is writing how the thoughts of him are so precious and so, so wonderful. So uh, a, couple of, a couple of things that uh, we can uh, focus on as far as some application and, and meaning. Number one, the Lord has a divine purpose in the creation of an individual. It were not an accident, but we were an intended, intended creation. And the fact that we are all unique, have you ever noticed that? Uh, you know, people are different, okay? Uh, have you ever noticed people may be different from your thought? And uh, uh, we're all unique, and we all fit together like a jigsaw puzzle for God's purpose. That is very true of a local church. I mean, I've been pastoring local churches for quite some time now. And I've noticed through all the, the places and people uh, that 
everybody was different. Everybody was unique. Now, the love for the Lord and trust in the, the Bible and them allowing me to be their pastor was a commonality with all of them. But, but each individual is a unique creation from God. We have a unique fingerprint. That's one of the great discoveries uh, the last couple of hundred years that, that we have a, a unique fingerprint and of the 8 billion or so people approximately alive today and the tens and tens or hundreds of millions that were alive before each of them had a unique fingerprint before God. Only God can do that. No evolution, no accident, no happenstance can cause that to happen. And beginning with your fingerprint, your very outward touch, you are unique to God and special. How much more do you think what's inside? Now, your fingerprint's outside of you, okay? But how much more what's inside? Your heart, your mind, your soul, your emotions, your feelings are important, are so important to God. And this is part of what Psalm 139 captures the divine purpose of creation of the individual. God has a reason and a purpose. You matter to God. And by the way, God wanted you here. Can you think of that? God wanted you here. It has a purpose for you. Uh, the next thing is that God shapes us. God, God shaped us. Look at verse 5 of Psalm 139. You have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Uh, he has hedged us and shaped us. God shapes us. And David says that the Lord covered his life from beginning to end. You have enclosed me behind and before. That's my whole life and laid your hand upon me. Do you know that God has laid his hand upon you, and uh, he keeps you? And by the way, his fingerprint can be visible in our lives, in our Christ-likeness, in our attitude, the way we love people, the way we serve people. God shaped us, and the Lord covered David's life from beginning to end, he uses the term God's hand. And you know what? This is not exclusive to David only. It's also with us and for us and to us and on us. His, now, we generally, in church talk, and if you get your exercise uh, running around evangelical circles and things, when we talk about God's hand on somebody, we tend to think of the person that was called to preach or a young gal called to mission and service and that God's hand is upon them. According to David in Psalm 139, whether you're a preacher or not, if you're not actually vocationally serving God, but you're a so-called lay person, brand new believer, long-term believer, it, you, you have a ministry, you don't have a ministry, but you're in between specific ministries in a local church, God has his hand on you. And as we obey God, and as we're sensitive to God, as we're in the Word, we can sense it. We can sense it. I, I don't want to use the term feel it, though we do, but I kind of eschew the word feeling. Because we don't live our Christian life as much by feeling as we do by fact. Okay, Feelings come and go. Feelings go up and down. I can confess to you as a pastor... Now, not in this church, but other churches I've pastored, and I've pastored three other churches, and they all prepared me to learn how to love people for this church. But in previous churches, if I based my ministry on feeling, I'd have cracked up a long time ago. <laughs> because there are some Sundays you feel like, I, I don't want to preach this church again, I quit, I don't want to be pastor here. Other Sundays... You'll feel like, uh, man, I could, I could pastor this church the rest of my life. And if a church ten times the size of this asked me to be their pastor, I'm staying here because the people love me. And 
I love the people. And by the way, I want you to know, I pastor a very loving church. Last Sunday was, uh, a couple of Sundays ago was my birthday. And I can't tell you the outpouring of love and gifts and things uh, that I got for my birthday. And at my age, I'm kind of in denial <laughs> of birthdays. <laughs> but that's okay. But th th this is a, uh, Arbor Christian Fellowship is a very, very loving, loving uh church and we see here that God shapes us and God has his hand on everybody not just the preacher type or the preacher boy or the, the, the young lady or the young man that surrendered to missions we always say God's hand is yes it is but God's hand is on all of us notice back verse 5 and verse uh, 6 here uh, they will sing uh, they will sing of the ways uh, you have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. And no matter what you're feeling today, up, down, spiritual, non-spiritual, upset, joyous, angry, angry at the news, angry at the pastor, angry at a situation a couple of Sundays ago that it's best to forget, uh, God's hand is upon you. Sometimes we could feel it. But I want to tell you, most of the times we don't, but it's there, and we benefit from that. So, according to this 139th Psalm, the Lord has a divine purpose for each and every one of us in the creation of the individual. He has shaped us and made us unique. God shapes us, and the Lord covered David's life from beginning to end, and he specifically says in verse 5 that God's hand was upon him. And I want to elude one more time. Yes, I know I'm repeating myself. But I don't know who it was, what communication expert said that uh, you got to say something six times for people to hear it and get it and let, us, let it sink in. So one more time, God's gracious, loving hand is upon us. Is upon us. And, you know, it, it felt... It, it feels good. I remember when playing Little League and up there batting and, you know, I swung and, and, and did well and got a single and scored, stole a base and, and came home. And uh, when I sat back on the bench, you know, my father was in the row behind me and my dad would, you know, just put his hand on my shoulder like, I'm proud of you, son. Well, you know what? God wants to do the same thing to Notice once again in Psalm 139, verse 5, you have enclosed me behind and before. We're surrounded as we're surrendered to him. Front. In other words, God's got us covered. God's got us covered individually. Corporately, God's got this church covered. And his hand is upon this church. No matter what strength or weakness pastor has or staff has or, or what leadership stuff, God has his hand and we are covered by that gracious, benevolent, strong, loving, powerful hand of God. God shapes us. Another thing we notice in this Psalm of 139 that there are two different destinies. And that's one thing we need to be aware of. Uh, i you know, through the internet, I, I've got friends from high school and other places. When they pass, it's always an automatic that they're go that they've gone to heaven, and it, it's great that at least they believe that heaven exists or there is a heaven, though it may not be the the biblical. And I'm not judging. I'm just saying, as a matter of fact, everybody thinks everybody's going to heaven. Okay, it's like student body left, everybody's going to heaven. But the Bible teaches. Everybody is not going to heaven. There's two destinies, heaven or hell. Heaven, being with God. Hell, a place of separation away from God. And the hell of hell is not the flaming, fiery furnace or the lake of fire. The hell of hell is separation from God, being lost forever, separation from God. And then the final thing and the most wonderful thing here about God as creator and is that creation is far more than 
God's assembly of DNA and cellular material. You know, there's so much talk today about vaccines and COVID and uh, how it affects this and is there a danger and whatnot that maybe mutates our, our DNA, RNA and things like that. Well, beyond all that, I'm not a doctor. I'm not going to give medical advice. I'm not a doctor. I don't even play one on TV, as they say. But I can give spiritual advice from the Word of God. And creation is more than God's assembly of our DNA and cellular material. It begins with God's glory. Creation is more than just arranging DNA by God in us and cellular material. It begins with God's glory and it stretches out that we give glory to God. That we are a glory unto God. So I wanted to just uh, challenge you with this 139th, 139th uh, a psalm here. A psalm of who God is and a psalm of our worth. I, I hope that you, you were able to capture in the study our worth. And maybe there are times uh, that uh, you might feel a little worthless for whatever reason uh, and things. That's a false evidence appearing real. By the way, that's F-E-A-R, false evidence appearing real. That spells out fear, acrostically, F-E-A-R, false evidence appearing real. What is real? is that we have God's hand upon us, whether we feel it or not. He is the God who is there, as Francis Schaeffer, uh, one of my reading uh, mentors, wrote a book called The God Who Is There. He is there whether you feel it or whether you sense it or not. And the issue is not feeling, but knowing the fact in our mind and, and in our heart. Creation is not simply a cold, mechanical affair by God. It is God's love, breath, and hand, touch, and His glory. The beauty of this 139th Psalm, as I close, it ends. It ends on a prayerful note. It ends on a beautiful, exalted note about God leading us in the everlasting way. Well, God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us uh, tonight through Facebook and through the digital uh, world. I hope this <coughs> psalm spoke to your heart. I challenge you. I, I challenge you to study and reread this psalm. Something that I do in my own life as a discipline. I've been doing it for years. Every morning I start out my day by reading a psalm. Reading a psalm. Uh, this morning I read the 113th Psalm. It's short. Yesterday I read the 112th Psalm. Tomorrow I'll read the 114th Psalm. And most of the Psalms are pretty short, maybe a dozen verses, a couple of long ones with 50 verses. Psalm 119 is 176. By the way, every verse of Psalm 119 is about the Bible and the Word of God. And it's rich, and you might want to divide that up into two or three days. But I challenge you to read a psalm every day because it is in the book of Psalms that we really get to know God. It is a book that is vertical. I call it going vertical, going upward towards God. So I challenge you. So tomorrow, maybe you start with Psalm 1 and then read the, the, every day until you finish at 150. And then you start, that's what I do. I start back all over again. And I take a few notes. I scribble in my Bible because I, I teach out of my Bible, it will enrich your life. I challenge you to, to begin and to start. So let me lead us in a word of prayer as I close out this Bible study section. Thank you so much for uh, joining us. Father, we thank you for this wonderful psalm. We thank you that you have made us and your hand is upon us. You lead us and you guide us. I thank you, God, that you lead us in the everlasting way. For I pray in Jesus' name, amen.